have to turn this on, make sure the pointer works. Okay, thanks everyone for coming and thanks for the sponsors for uh, sponsoring this event. It's great to have an opportunity to venture here and see what's really a model system. Part of why I wanted to accept this invitation was to see the hub and spoke model and perhaps take some lessons back home to Alabama, uh, which I know I will now as a result of my visits yesterday. Um, the uh, title, as you can see, A Crisis of Opioids, The Limits of Prescription Control. A couple of disclosures um, and a comment. Um, I don't have pharmaceutical money, grants or whatever. I used to own some stock, basically what I had inherited from my grandfather and we sold it, but my wife still has some. Um, my position, I work for the Veterans Administration Hospital in Birmingham and the University of Alabama at Birmingham, but these are my views, not those of my employers. Uh, there's a way in which this talk will convey a certain professorial certainty, uh, which is sort of part of the act of giving a talk, but that doesn't mean that everything is fixed and known. I'm just giving a best guess based on what I can see at the present time. Uh, I'll mix cases here, some where I was the caregiver, uh, some where I had access to the record. I won't always tell you which. Uh, I want to acknowledge collaborators and colleagues, as you see, including Dr. Sattel, who helped educate me to think about addiction, pain, primary care, dependence, all these interlocking concepts. Two impressions from the moment we find ourselves in with regard to opioids and prescriptions. This is a cartoon that I had to commission for a precious $400 uh, for the uh, article that you just heard Rick mention. Um, so we, in talking with the editor, we thought, let's get a cartoon. So the physician sitting in the office, surrounded by CDC, prescription drug monitoring program, blaring headlines about a crisis, and they say, too many people are dying. The situation is kind of out of control. I thought they were helping you, but right now I have to stop your lower tab pills. And the patient, and it's my nurse I work with who told me to put this line in the patient's mouth. The patient says, what, well, what did I do? And right outside the window, of course, you see the devastating sight of a young person injecting. Um, and it very much often feels today in the real world of hospital and primary care that that's what we're doing. We're changing the care of these folks for the care of those folks. Of course, somebody here is going to say, wait, there is a relationship between what happened in the office and outside the office, and I know that. But de facto, what we're doing right now is changing everybody's care in the office because we're very, very concerned about what's happening to these folks who are dying. Another impression of the moment we find ourselves in before we sort of get to the meat of the matter. Uh, you heard Rick mention this, a letter that we wrote in response to a proposal a proposal from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, a proposal that said for those patients in the Medicare programs who are getting a prescription drug benefit and who happen to receive a total dose of opioids over 90 milligram equivalents, we propose that payment be blocked at the pharmacy, a patient not receive that medicine until a formal prior authorization procedure takes place. It's a three or a four way communication process that can take up to a week or longer. Um, and then, you know, at such time as approval is granted, we'll release this uh, payment. Um, they also proposed a seven day limit for all opioid naive recipients, which actually is embodied in the regulations they did pass. This was, there was an open comment period on this proposed regulation. And there was a comment, a lot of comments, but among them was a letter where I was the first author, but my colleagues, Adam and AJ, helped kind of put together the material. And we said, we don't think this is really correct. And the reasons for that are going to come out over the talk, source of the, uh, course of this talk. But in essence, we said, you're going to force involuntary discontinuations and tapers in a way that completely violates the CDC guidelines, going to cause a lot of havoc. Uh, the first 180 signatures came from physicians, mostly in palliative care, addiction, and pain in primary care within, 100, uh, within 24 hours. Within a week or so, we had 220. Fully eight people who had worked on the CDC guideline signed to oppose this proposed policy from CMS. It was pronounced too cruel by Jane Ballantyne, the president of Physicians for Responsible Opioid Prescribing, a person who had worked tirelessly to bring to light harms from excessive opioid prescribing. Uh, you can see the letter online. Um, in fact, our efforts made the cover of the Times. The red box is to say, Mom, uh, I made the cover of the New York Times. Please love me. Uh, and, then, <laughs> and then, but the quote I want you to hear is not from me, but from Joanna Starles. It says, the decision to taper opioids 
should be based on whether the benefits for pain and function outweigh the harm for that patient. That takes a lot of clinical judgment. It's, it's individualized and nuanced, a stance I certainly endorse. Before we dive into sort of the scientific and clinical meat of the matter, I, want, I hope we can agree tentatively with some of these points. Opioids were vastly overprescribed from 2000 to 2012. Doing so, in my view, caused harm. A systems level decline in reliance on opioids as a central part of healthcare is desirable, broadly speaking. My thesis, however, which I'll try to defend here, is that forced opioid reductions are now quasi mandated. They violate ethical and evidentiary norms of medical practice. All agencies that, party, that are party to this trend should act now to protect the population who we are putting at risk and harming in the name of solving a social crisis. What's gonna happen here is I'm gonna give a case example. Then I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the epidemiology of prescribing an overdose, describe pill control policies, data for and data against, and close with a restatement of some of my concerns. Let's talk about a case. This is a 73-year-old man. I, this is an actual case approved for presentation and shown at a scientific meeting. At a prior publication, before I had such approval, I described this individual uh, with identifiers changed uh, to show it as a female. But this is a 73-year-old man with chronic pain and polyarthritis from the late 1990s onward who had a renal transplant in 2003. Uh, had received opioids since 2001, ultimately arriving at doses in the range of 105 to 140 morphine milligram equivalents for several years. It had been a combination of methadone for pain plus oxycodone. In 2014, physician, uh, one physician, there are multiple physicians who changed this person's care, changed the methadone to morphine sustained action based on VA appears to be getting away from methadone. Note, I'm talking about VA, but the Veterans Administration is a microcosm of all medical practice. It happens to be a more transparent microcosm, so we hear the stories, we see a lot, but this is happening everywhere. So get away from methadone. Then in 2015, the morphine sulfate, uh, long acting, just dropped off the record and the patient was left with oxycodone, 30 milligrams a day, which is 45 morphine milligram equivalents. Quite a drop. And then in 2016, I, a visit, he said, look, everything hurts all the time. Physicians' response, in response to incentives upon them, was to drop the dose of the opioids from 30 to um, 22.5 milligram morphine equivalents, hydrocodone instead of oxycodone. And about six to eight months later, the patient was admitted to the hospital with progressive renal failure. Remember, it's a kidney transplant patient. Well, why did that happen? What he described was a progressive loss of energy over many months, not withdrawal, just loss of energy, inability to keep up with his medications, including the ones that are designed to prevent rejection of the transplanted kidney. His past history suggested he wouldn't be someone we would have been happy today to start on opioids exactly, be a little nervous. He had two psychiatric hospitalizations in the 70s uh, for depression. There was a past history of alcohol use disorder Hadn't drank since 1989 with one lapse in 2011, but it was short-lived. No one nearby had previously married, no social support. Reevaluation showed that he had acute and chronic rejection of that transplanted kidney. And the acute rejection is something normally prevented by taking the very medicines that he had found himself unable to keep up with during the last year. In March of 2017, he was dialyzed kind of restabilized, uh, bumped up his opioids to oxycodone, 10 milligrams four times a day, told the local primary care doctor, looks like the dose reductions just kind of left him flagging, probably went too far, leave him up. Within a month of being out, the doctor took the doses back down because that's what we do, that's how we roll now. And he was readmitted twice in the next six months for resurgent renal failure. He died in September of 2017. And in the last 24 hours of his life, he was given unlimited access to opioids once they were absolutely sure he was about to die. So was this patient protected by the tapering of opioids that he underwent? He didn't protest, actually. He didn't like it, but he didn't protest. Does anybody think he's better off dead than alive on opioids? I can't imagine anybody really believes that, but I see cases like this all the time. So 
let's, before I jump into policy, somebody says, well, what happened to the, why did this happen? So just clinically, just to understand, this is not acute withdrawal. This is not a surge of diarrhea and sweating and yawning. This is, uh, slow tapers prevent that, for sure. This is a protracted abstinence syndrome. He'd been on opioids for a long term. We can ha di debate its value. He has resurgent pain. He had psychological dependence. Those two are intertwined. For these folks, slow taper may be desirable, may work for some, they may feel better, but for others, it just doesn't turn out very well. Um, the policy context, big news coverage, not just of the VA, but certainly of the Veterans Administration. We prescribed a lot. Aaron Glantz, anybody know him? Nobody knows him? Okay, he got a Peabody Award for reporting on the high prescribing. And the moment his reports came out, I thought, oh, I know what's gonna happen. There's gonna be a massive push to crush down those prescriptions. If anybody knows Aaron Glantz, please suggest that he continue to report on the issue that he got his Peabody Award for. Because we're still dealing with the outcomes of those reports. That's part of my daily life. Epidemiology. Okay, this is not a surprise. 64,000 overdoses from all drugs combined in 2016. Alcohol causes a fair number of deaths. I don't think we should forget that. Almost all of you are familiar with the changing epidemiology of the types of opioids found in people who die. Of course, what these graphs fail to disclose is that multiple drugs are involved in most overdoses, and so each drug gets counted multiple times, or each death gets, contributes to multiple lines in these kinds of graphs. But clearly, there's been a rise of synthetic opioids other than methadone, heroin, you see that rise in natural and semi-synthetic opioids, but that any death where heroin, fentanyl, and a Lortab pill are found does contribute to all three lines at once. So that's part of why that uh, prescription-type opioid line is still going up. Um, okay, I animated. There's some relationship between our prescribing history and these deaths. Um, this is correlational data up through 2011 where essentially the prescribing, the sales, and the deaths, and the treatment admissions for opioids all went up at the same time. So there's clearly a relationship. There's not no relationship. We, as clinicians, played a role. But we've kind of moved into a different era since 2011. High-dose prescribing, based on my combination of two reports, is about down 57% since 2008. And uh, overall prescriptions are down 27% since 2012, again, combining two different reports from two different commercial databases. So that's a pretty big reduction, actually. And as you know, this decline in prescribing has not been matched by a decline in overdose deaths. The overdose deaths that you see in yellow here combine those that might be related to prescriptions and to fentanyl and to heroin. We're gonna disentangle those in a moment. But clearly, we haven't gotten quite the return on investment we were expecting. I feel obligated at this point to discuss something about what I think about pain care and opioids. You're gonna hear some people who will just say there's no evidence that opioids are helpful for chronic pain. Uh, so I feel I should disclose my reading of the literature. And my reading of the literature leaves me with four simultaneous sentiments, observations, assessments that live in constant tension in my mind at the same time. One is that opioids for chronic pain are crummy drugs. Another is that they're sometimes the last uh, best option, and others that they're sometimes quite helpful, and another is that they're not spawn of the devil, although the question sometimes arises. And I can give you data <laughs> from the literature to support each one of these assessments. I'm not gonna go over all four, it's too redundant, but why are they crummy? Okay, so but in trials, 30 to 60% of people who try opioids or chronic pain stop the drugs, they cannot tolerate them due to the side effects. Uh, so they're not uniformly an attractive treatment for chronic pain. There is some level of, uh, uh, of nuanced addiction in people who don't seem to have had prior addictions to the best as we can tell. And surely somebody in this room knows someone where it seems like they got the pills and then they went to the races and things just kind of spiraled. What percentage is that? The average percentage cited in the CDC guideline based on a prospective type of study is between 0.6 and 7%, but remember we are not all, I was taught this line by Dr. Sattel, we are not all at equal risk of addiction. So a younger adult and an 85 year old and a person with pre-existing trauma are not all interchangeable with each other. So I have trouble with all these average numbers. 
3 to 20 percent, depending on the study, who are on opioids for chronic pain seem to have some problematic behavior, some volatility that might not qualify as an addiction diagnosis, but it doesn't look exactly like it's all going well. And they're not routinely superior, in musculoskeletal pain at least, to stepwise offering of other treatments. This is from a trial published by Dr. Aaron Krebs in JAMA. That doesn't mean that every single person that I see in my clinic would willingly enter a randomized trial or has just musculoskeletal pain. But still, I mean, a one-year-long trial, they weren't like, you know, God's gift to the universe. Okay, why not spawn of the devil? Uh, okay, opioids are effective in trials of limited duration for chronic pain against placebo. They weren't proven ineffective in that trial by Dr. Krebs. They were just not better than other treatments. And in long-term follow-up of people who've been in trials, somewhere between 25 and 33 percent of people just sort of stay on them long-term at a constant dose. I talk to a lot of those types of people. As best I can tell, they're not just staving off diarrhea by taking their pills. What do the CDC guidelines say? Okay, uh, shortest summary ever. Try to avoid starting opioids if you can for care of chronic pain. Good. Evaluate and document the risks and benefits when starting them. Okay. Go for the lowest effective dose. Be particularly careful if you're considering escalating the dose in your new patient at 50 or 90 milligram equivalents. All right. For patients already on opioids, this is recommendation seven, the single most misinterpreted and neglected aspect of this guideline, and the single most important in my view. For patients already on opioids, evaluate the harm to that patient and the benefit to that patient. And if, and there's no dose target specified, there's no mandated taper, there's no requirement to bring the dose down to under 90. It says if the benefits fail to exceed the harms, consider tapering the dose at that point because you're not getting benefit. That's pretty much ignored, but that to me is a very important statement. That's what the guideline experts said they supported. They suggest urine drug tests, prescription drug monitoring program use. I do both of those things. There's not much data for them. And the evidence quality across this guideline, soberingly, was consistently low. This is not, uh, this could have been called CDC's experts list of strong suggestions. Um, not bad. I support it. But pill control policy has gone way beyond what that guideline said. Um, there are two epidemiologic hopes that guide what our legislators are doing, what our payers are doing, what our medical societies are doing. One is that we will shield patients against overdose by reducing their doses. That's the shielding icon. The other is that the prescriptions, if prescriptions went up, they're going to come down at some later delay. Addiction, which went up, will come down. And at some later delay from that, uh, deaths and overdoses, et cetera, will, will begin to come down. Those are the hopes. The policies that enact and reflect these hopes are diverse. They're not all simply a government regulation passed by a state or federal legislature, although those are part of the mix. All of these things collide and cascade upon the physician who's contemplating using the prescription power. There's quality metrics that measure their quality of care that are based simply on the number of patients at a given dose. Do you have a certain number of patients on opioids compared to their peers? You're a bad doctor. If you have a certain number above a given dose, you're a bad doctor. It doesn't matter who you take care of. It's just that number. Rest payers restrict coverage for opioid pain medicine based on dose. Prescription drug monitoring programs are interesting because I think they can be helpful sometimes to discover certain types of trouble, but they also serve to show patients and physicians that we're all subject to investigation. There is no warrant required for law enforcement to enter this part of the medical record. This weird window, which shows only a person a name, a dose, and a pill count. That is open to law enforcement. Pharmacies have something called red flags. It predates the CDC guideline, by the way, that basically says, look, you as a pharmacist are on notice if you release the prescription. Well, some of them are like, you know, if a kid comes into your pharmacy looking stoned out of their mind asking for Gabby's and Zannies, probably that's a problem. <laughs> Conversely, if a patient has been rejected by a prior pharmacy and comes to your pharmacy, that's also considered a red flag in a publication from the California Pharmacy Department. So one mal, mal occurrence at one pharmacy might set up a 65-year-old with chronic pain as a red flag patient who should not be, have their prescription filled at the next pharmacy. Law enforcement, medical board rules, rules from employers, FDA, CVS Health, Express Scripts, Walmart, 
This is a map of all the various states that have enacted regulations as of last summer, according to the National Coalition of State Legislatures. Some of those regulations are pretty benign, some are not, but all of them serve to show physicians, you're at risk, you're on notice, you're being counted, you may not want to do this. And the benefit of all these policies is to bring prescribing down and to create a, a public message particularly for people who want to contain their liabilities, like insurers. So Cigna here is saying, look, we, we reduced opioid use by 25%. How did they count it? Milligrams prescribed. Milligrams, volume. By the way, the most efficient way to bring down those milligrams is to focus on the high-dose patients and get their milligrams down, because other literature shows us that about 70% of the milligrams consumed are consumed by the top 10% of consumers. That is long-term chronic patients on high dose. So you want to bring down milligrams, you have to target the people already at high dose, and you have to force their doses down. That's how you get that. Here is a rejection letter that is actually tweeted online. It's from United Healthcare. It's to a patient. It's a little bit long to read, but it uh, says, look, our decision to deny coverage for this medicine is unchanged. Our decision does not reflect any view about the appropriateness of this medicine. Only you and your provider can make decisions about your care. And then they go on and say, but look, you, your health plan covers up to 90, and this is more than 90, so you're not getting it. Sorry. Physicians clearly have changed their behavior in response to this concatenation. And remember what I said at the beginning. I think on whole, a broad reduction in our insistence on using opioids in so many situations where they really aren't particularly helpful is good. But when, you, when pollsters ask physicians, why are you reducing prescribing? Here are the reasons they give. Uh, you can't read it, but I'll just say rules. This one over here, the orange bar, is essentially fear. Uh, this one over here is difficulty of caring for pain patients. And this one, this tall bar here, is hassles. About 20% say that it's actually based on an improved understanding of the treatment that they were considering offering. So the minority of physicians who've changed their prescribing say it's based on something to do with better understanding of how to care for their patients. The majority say rules, fear, hassle, and difficulty dealing with these people is why I'm changing my care. That's a different approach to medical care regulation than, than, than is typical. Okay, let's look at data for and data against. And I'm focusing, as you can tell, on the dose reduction side of the equation. I am fully comfortable with not prescribing opioids for nearly all dental extractions, for sprained ankles, uh, with not handing people bottles of pills when they basically need one or two days. Those are kind of easy uh, gimmies to make. But what data support restricting doses in patients with chronic pain and bringing those doses down? The core of it are multiple correlational large database studies. And those studies typically look at prescription receiving populations and they look at the rate of death from overdose of those people, and they inform the CDC guideline to be cautious about dose. And what they show, and this is from Bonnert, it's a little hard to see, but I'm going to basically say in this veteran study, uh, but there's a non-veteran study, the prescribed dose was associated with an increased risk of the overdose event in chronic pain patients. Here, if you received over 100 milligram morphine equivalents, seven times increased risk of an overdose event. So dose as prescribed, seem to have something to do with the event that we call overdose, the poisoning event. So it was a risk factor, and there's more than one study that shows that. What about data showing that reduction in dose kind of works out? Uh, this, was, this was a review of the literature published in August of 2017, again led by a team with Dr. Aaron Krebs. Joe Frank was the first author. And they reviewed the world's trial literature on this. Randomized trials require voluntary patients, which is a very important caveat, since most of what's happening is not voluntary. But with voluntary and well-run programs, dose reduction can be achieved for some patients, not all. And some actually feel better. And the evidence was rated low quality. And the authors cautioned that there are no studies of mandatory, involuntary dose reductions or discontinuations and insufficient evidence on adverse effects, such as overdose or switch to illicit opioids or suicidality. So no evidence on the thing that most of our policies are incentivizing, but plausible evidence on the thing which some people are experts at doing, which is helping a patient decide, oh, I'll, I'll try to take my dose down, see if I feel better, and actually do feel better. Sum up. 
Voluntary taper with strong support to the patient seems to allow dose to go down. Average pain doesn't rise, although it rises for some. And there's no data to suggest yet that the safety of those patients has increased at all. No trial data has looked at a safety outcome. Okay, what about data that might not favor this? Because so much legislation is focused on this. There's actually a petition right now to the FDA and a proposed law from Senator Markey that would propose that we take off the market any opioid, which when taken as directed, would allow a person to exceed 90 milligrams, ultra high dose. So what data might not favor our focus on tapering these doses? So this is data which combines people who had overdose or suicide, but the same graph will appear if we isolate just overdose or suicide from the Department of Veterans Affairs, presented at the uh, 2018 um, Rx Opioid and Heroin Summit in April. And it says, look, what was the dose received by the veteran who had one of these events? And, what, and what's a little small here is that you actually find out that most of the events, the bulk of this curve sits below 90 milligram equivalent. So most of the events we call overdose happen at a low prescribed dose. Ditto for suicide as well. Also, in green, substance use disorder diagnosis, uh, or and mental health very often. Red, mental health only. Um, people lacking such diagnoses are in blue. So most people who have these events are receiving low prescribed doses. Most people having these events of concern have substance use disorder or mental health disorder diagnoses. Does that mean that dose doesn't matter at all? Not necessarily, but it means that the word overdose itself might be misconstruing the event that we wish to prevent if it mostly happens when the dose prescribed is low. We probably have to think about something other than the prescribing of a dose, which is precisely where the regulators are focusing, if we actually want to protect people. To put it another way, and I said this to a group of insurers, if you're comfortable only addressing 13% of the problem, please continue to focus on the people at high dose. As long as you're comfortable neglecting 87% of the people at risk, you're doing great. <laughs> they stopped. They paused for a second. Another study, I could show you one of many. This is a point system for rating who's at risk of an overdose event based on retrospective looks at data. And essentially what it showed is that things related to the prescribed opioid accounted for 36% of the index that predicted the overdose event. And things related to mental health and substance disorder accounted for another 36% of the index related to who would have such an event. Uh, so clearly, the people who we wish to care for are kind of complicated. They're not just driven or determined by a dose. In fact, in VA data, the predictors of having the event we call overdose are, and it's a little small, but you know, PTSD, depression, bipolar, alcohol use disorder, those are all uh, kind of substance use disorders, prior mental health, uh, inpatient mental health treatment history, 16 times increased risk of overdose event. Uh, liver disease, other neurological, receipt of a benzodiazepine. So much law is focused on making sure no one gets a benzodiazepine with their opioid, or at least regulatory efforts. So that's one point, that multiplies the risk by 1.4, receipt of a benzodiazepine. And I actually am very cautious about prescribing benzodiazepines. But if you have a patient who's receiving opioids with no benzodiazepine but has PTSD, that actually probably requires a more careful, that actually elevates your risk quite a bit more than the benzo. Why is that? Well, probably people who have emotional chaos, who are happening to receive a prescription, have unpredictable chaotic events in which they combine not just what we prescribe, but other stuff, and then they overdose and die. We need to pay attention to these risk factors far more than, I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't pay, pay attention to benzos, but we, these things matter. Um, in a recent study from the Kaiser Health System, Dose of prescribed did not predict overdose at all, just hinting at the complexity of the data we're yet to understand. The predictors were history of substance use disorder, history of mental illness, tobacco, receipt of a long-acting opioid, but not dose at all. Who receives opioids at high dose? And this is really, I want you to begin, this picture is stolen from um, the New Yorker, and the face is made of pills. And it's really the goal. It, I know why they made, chose the picture, but the goal I use, for which I use this picture is to say, let's start talking about the person rather than the pills we're seeking to discuss, manage, control, uh, deliberate over. The people who historically in those large databases receive high-dose opioids, for good and for bad, multiple pain diagnoses, psychiatric diagnoses, depression, substance use disorder, present or remitted, 
high rates of polypharmacy, all the things that predict actually having a bad event on opioids are the people we selected on average to receive high dose opioids. So it's actually a population at risk that we should be focused on rather than a pill at risk. Caveat, I know people on high doses who need high doses it seems and have none of those risk factors. Those people are also part of our lives. So tapering, so many people advocate. We need to bring down those people to safe doses. And as I said, we have some data that with voluntary patients of some kind, it can be done. But you know, taper doesn't have a 100% successful track record. In a randomized controlled trial focused on people whose pill problem qualified as prescription opioid use disorder, people who volunteered to enter the trial, people who wanted to be tapered, uh, this was published about seven years ago. They were randomly assigned to different kinds of tapers with buprenorphine, without buprenorphine, longer, slower, voluntary. One year fail rate, failure rate, 91.4%. And in that era, they wound up back on pills in some way or another. So the tapering strategy, even with volunteers who really, really want it, if their level of dependence is such that it might qualify for a prescription opioid use disorder, tapering is pretty bad failure. Now, not all patients with chronic pain sit as prescription opioid use disorder. Not all of them sit over in the benign, I'm just doing great category. Most, maybe many, sit in a middle category where the dependence in play is a little bit complicated. It doesn't always look neat and clean. Can we assume that every one of those people should be tapered and they're somehow gonna be safer and better? To me, trial data like this should give us a note of caution. So what has happened as a re result of bringing down high dose prescribing is shown here. And this graph was prepared uh, by Sally's colleague at the American Enterprise Institute and essentially shows the number of overdoses per year in which only prescription type opioids were found. Doesn't mean they were prescribed, but hydrocodone, oxycodone. Basically the number's been about constant, 9,500 to 10,000. If you throw in the people who had methadone, but no heroin and no fentanyl, it gets to around 12,000, it would be higher. But we've actually reduced, in this graph, high dose prescribing went down 48%. Overdoses involving prescription type opioids didn't change a whit in eight years. So how much investment should we put in this policy given these returns in the last eight years? So let's talk about ethics. Speaking as a physician or as a clinician, as a nurse, as an allied health professional, do we normally take a non-consensual action on a patient, which is what is filling my inbox and my Twitter feed, my doctor cut my meds, my doctor cut my meds. Do we normally take a non-consensual action on patients who are adherent and stable, absent any strong evidence for those actions that sometimes results, as in the case I showed you, in the patient's death? How often do you think doctors take action against patients' wills that can sometimes just cause death as a side effect? Do we let others induce physicians who are the prescribers to take such action? Is that an ordinary standard? If your answer is no, not usually, then we have to ask if we have a justification so powerful as to overcome customary medical ethics. Do we have such a justification? Part of the reason I'm concerned is the countless accumulation of stories like this. Meredith and Jay Lawrence published, I reviewed the record in depth. I'm not gonna show all the slides, but. Meredith is the surviving wife of Jay. Jay had a very complex history. He'd been slowly escalated to very high dose opioids, benzodiazepines, multiple invasive procedures. He had a past history of remitted alcoholism. He had a complex chronic pain problem, which probably was overtreated for many, many years and just wound up on high dose opioids. He was not a success story for opioids. If you read his story in depth, conversely, he was semi-stable. And at a certain point, his physician said, look, the regulatory standards applicable to us in the state of Tennessee is that we need to reduce your doses. We're reducing by 30% now. We'll do another 30% at your next visit and 30% after that. And the outcome carefully deliberated between Jay and Meredith was, we can buy a gun and you can shoot yourself in the front seat of the car and I'll hold your hands as you do that. Suicide is a common event. This is a particularly tragic extreme example but I hear about many more. The media is beginning to notice these things, sort of patients struggling as they're being forced off of these pills, always, in my view, in violation of the CDC guideline. Lots of coverage. 
This is a letter to me from a woman who is an advocate and herself a pain patient. She's tracked 58 patients where she knows the names and contact information where they committed suicide after discontinuation. She has 103 where she can't figure out if she has the contact information. That's a significant number. I can't study them all. This is actually not my day job. My day job is homeless health care. Oh, I did not mean to do that. There's a new name for these patients who are being taken off. They're called pain refugees. We've created a new category of human being. Um, as I've raised these concern, uh, concerns about these folks, there's been a response. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services is interested. They changed their, their plan for 2019. They have asked for uh, a briefing, several briefings, and they're going to have myself and A.J. Manhopra and Adam Gordon give a grand rounds in June. Insurers are beginning to show hints of concern that they might be harming patients, and many prominent advocates on the opioid issue have asked if I'm funded by pharma, uh, who controls me? Uh, they've pointed out that opioids themselves are associated with suicide, which is actually true, uh, and su suggested that thus far we have insufficient data to justify spending public resources on investigating these people who are dying as a result of the changes we're enacting. I don't agree. In June of last year, I suggested to the CDC, and I wrote this to them, and then I presented it publicly with the first author of the CDC guideline present, and I was next to her. I would like the CDC to clarify its seventh recommendation of its own guideline and defend it, as written. I would like them to assemble stakeholders to gauge the implementation of the CDC's guideline as it's played out in reality, something that their own expert advisory group suggested that they do. And I suggested that they apply CDC resources to investigate the outbreak of suicides. You might be, do they do that? Yeah, actually they do that. Um, Here's an investigation by the CDC's Epidemiologic Intelligence Service of eight suicides, eight suicides among youth in Delaware. I'm saying, gee, we've got 58. Should be possible to investigate them. What's going on? So if harm is happening, I mean, they've done none of this, by the way. So if harm is happening, why would a public agency not be willing to investigate despite being asked to? Why would they not be willing to follow their own experts' recommendations? And this leads me to a moral question, which is, is there something about the lives of people who've received long-term opioids for pain that makes their lives and deaths not worth measuring and investigating when they suffer adverse outcomes? What did they do that makes them so worthless that we can't even get our own Centers for Disease Control to investigate their deaths, which appear to be related to a misunderstanding of their guideline? How did we get to that point, that they're that low on the moral totem pole. I think we can correct course. Payers should correct course. They can offer explicit safe harbor. They can declare, physicians, if you're trying to protect your patient, we'll protect you. Dose reductions don't really address most overdose risk anyway. That's one of my key points to you. The overdose risk factors are identifiable and they're treatable. Polypharmacy, complex mental illness, we should be caring for these things. We should care for the person. We can and should invest in enhanced care for multimorbid populations. I think a lot of that needs to happen in primary care. Final observation, pill control versus pill pushing. Today's pill control and yesterday's pill pushing, sort of the party to which we all came, including the pharmaceutical industry, which was happy to profit, these are mirror images of each other. They embody a thirst for simple solutions. They enable a failure to build systems of care for complex, vulnerable populations. Populations like those which the Howard Center is trying to serve. The zeitgeist phrase which just hit me in the last few weeks is opioid stewardship. Opioid stewardship. I think we should be stewards for the people we wish to take care of, not for their pills. And I hope that it, refocusing on the people and listening to them and involving them in the decisions we make will help us chart a better course forward. With that, thank you very much for your attention. Did I eat up all the time or do we still have time for questions? Oh, excellent. I saw a hand up over there. Sandy, I got you. And then one over there. Microphone's coming around. Hi, thank you. That was a very engaging talk. Um, I would add um, to solutions is looking at some of the structural problems within medicine that contributed to the problem. I wonder what your thoughts are. Um, and, I, and I think it actually ties into what Dr. Sattel was talking about, that 
the over-medicalization of a lot of human suffering uh, combined with um, uh, physicians not being adequately uh, able to protect themselves from commercial interest that um, contributed to the epidemic. I mean, I, I, you've highlighted a particular problem of people who are sort of victims of that, but it seems to me that if we don't address some of the structural problems within medicine, we're just waiting for the next problem to come about. And I'm I curious agree what your you. thoughts are. The reason that physicians seem to escalate doses in the patients where they prescribe are often responses to psychological distress, which is treated as a kill-solvable problem when it often is not. And that's part of how we got into this mess, is the sense that we can medicalize it, uh, that we can do it in brief little 15-minute like, office visits. Um, by the way, it doesn't have to be a physician. It could be a nurse who's going to do the visit that actually helps the patient overcome their suffering. Um, I'm not wedded to physicians being the solution here. But yeah, we, we take human suffering, and we create a sense that it will be solvable out of a bottle. Um, and right now, we're kind of doing that in reverse. But the underlying commercial interests and the arrangement in which we pay for care and kind of mostly for procedures and quick prescriptions, that's our decision as a society to incentivize that kind of care. And tapering uh, involuntarily kind of is a reaction against that. Unfortunately, taper is not a treatment for pain. I had a question uh, regarding doctors, nurses, um, social workers, ad addiction counselors. Um, when we encounter somebody who has been primarily stable on opiate medication, and right now I have a, a client on my caseload who has been stable on high dose, who now he and his physician are being investigated, um, what what kind of, is frontline workers, what kind of advice or recommendations would you give to advocate for patients that we see that are stable and possibly warrant remaining on that medication? From the standpoint of protecting the patient, what's important is to document their functioning. I mean, the reason we're doing any interventions is to help someone function well. So um, what I write in my own chart, but what I would love to have, which I ask psychologists to evaluate sometimes, but we're social workers, is, is this patient functioning well in their daily life? Can I show, as a matter of the record, that their functioning is good? Uh, people can be tolerant in very high doses, um, and really, it might be, might have well have been foolish to elevate that dose. Uh, but it doesn't matter. The question is, how are they functioning today? And if I, if, if I were a physician under investigation, and God, I hope I don't become one, it would be, I'd love to have a, a set of notes that say, this patient's holding down a job. He doesn't seem particularly volatile, or she doesn't seem particularly volatile. Their uh, current functioning includes attending this community group, volunteering for this civic group, and, hold it, and, 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 and restoration of family relationships. My assessment currently is that the functioning of this patient in their current uh, situation is pretty high. And that would be a record that then actually does justify and align with the CDC guideline. I wish that uh, we had not erected a structure in which dose is used to identify who should be investigated. That is built into some of the statements you see from uh, the DEA, from, uh, sometimes from CMS, which sort of you call anybody at high dose an overutilizer or a potential overutilizer, but in, built into that, um, and not, in, not supported by the underlying regulations for CMS, by the way, but built into that is an assumption that the patient's condition and history can be ignored. Uh, but as clinicians, we don't ignore conditions in history, and we shouldn't, but we should document functioning. There's another question right here. Yeah, so I, uh, um, I work in the profession of policing, and it's interesting to watch another profession bristle at regulations because it's lost the public trust. Um, you know, I, I find that, um, you know, when, when you act in ways, not you, you per se, but when a profession acts in ways that, that have these collateral consequences that are unbearable uh, to some people that, that expose, impose externalities on, on other parts of the community, uh, you know, that cause an elevated morbidity and mortality risk uh, that people don't find justified, and they do it with, like, a complete lack of self-awareness. And then the very same lawmakers that, that regulate policing or regulate medicine, and we turn around and say, hey, you know, we're the practitioners here. No, no, there's this whole really careful thing that we've done with all of our research, and you're hamstringing our abilities to deliver you know, the safety we want. You know, I think the feeling I get is that we, we don't earn the right to, to say that until we regain trust, Right. 
And right now, I feel that the average lawmaker is responding to a populace that, that doesn't trust the profession to make these decisions because, in fact, they have not made them right for quite some time, and it's exacted a big toll. And I sympathize with you. It's very frustrating to have people who don't do the job tell you how to, uh, to do it. But it's, it's instructive. I think this is a tremendous learning opportunity for both of our professions. And the last thing I'll say when you talk about the suicides is talking about morality, there's, there's another way to, uh, to see this, which is um, this epidemic fomented by prescribing caused the need for a population-level intervention. Population-level interventions aren't perfect, right? You try to maximize the intervention to reduce morbidity and mortality. You get this increase in suicides in order to get the course effect of, of bringing everything under control. It's very unfortunate, but it seems to be the way people are, are hell-bent on doing it until we can take the fine-tooth comb that you want and we regain people's trust. So what you said is political reality. Physicians were party to a collective delusion. Uh, we were guilted into it. I'm not saying that I particularly was an aggressive prescriber, but as a profession, we were guilted. Maybe we were lusted into it, like, yeah, I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to make pain disappear. And, and political reality is that policymakers may, uh, will certainly discount words like mine because of that collective behavior. At the same time, a couple points. First of all, um, we still have always the right to say the data doesn't support what you're doing. The return on the investment thus far hasn't been that good. Second. No policeman should ever be told that in order to create a condition of safety, we need you to discharge your weapon at an innocent person. It shouldn't happen. But there actually are physicians at this point who are under such pressure that they feel they need to do traumatic injury to their own patients. It's a violation of medical ethics. So even if my argument is an utter failure politically, and it may well be for the time being, my view is that as a clinician, it is absolutely unacceptable to put me or my colleagues in a situation where we must kill our own patients in order to solve a social problem. We have no choice but to speak up about that, even if our profession sacrificed its credibility in exactly the way that you described. We can't not speak, just as a cop can't speak about being told to shoot their weapon in the wrong situation. You have to talk, you have to speak up, and then eventually hope that we all sort of gel down, come to our senses, and find a way through it. Somebody else had a hand up. I did see it. Yes. I'm curious of what your thoughts are on using cannabis to reduce um, opioid use. Oh, you're going to make me miserable now. <laughs> I have completely mixed feelings on cannabis because I, insofar as uh, the data seem a little bit promising and I run into the occasional patient who says, look, I, I smoke marijuana. I don't need as much opioid as I feel better. My, thing, my response is God bless you. And then at the same, and, and by the way, I, I was senior author an article that showed long-term cannabis use, no major harm to pulmonary function, lung function. Conversely, I am desperately suspicious of the industrial interests that want to push cannabis just like they push opioids. I realize that on average, it looks to me like cannabis is kind of lower risk than opioid pills. So I do get it, but I'm really nervous about what happens as we, in our inevitable exuberant American way. We industrialize the interest. We sell it to everybody as the cure for everything. So I'm nervous about that on the horizon and yet pretty sympathetic to a patient who says this has worked for me. Although as point of fact, as a federal employee, I am not permitted to counsel a patient on cannabis. I, I just can't. There's a rule that says I can't do it. Yes, in the back. I wanted to um, make a point that seems to be happening, at least in our community. Within the hub-and-spoke model, um, we have a pretty open door. We have no waiting list. And we find that we are taking in more and more of these pain refugees. Yeah. I love this term. Um, they're not quite appropriate for our program, but they have nowhere else to go. Once they enter our door, they receive a diagnosis of an opiate use disorder. And now this is going to affect their care for the rest of their lives within the medical community. You know, then all of a sudden their primary care says, oh, I didn't realize you had a substance use disorder. Now I need to be wary and maybe take you off of some of your other medications. And it's creating this other, you know, yeah. really horrible downslide. So yeah, we, we are forced to do a situation where we have to apply a diagnosis that doesn't perfectly fit the individual in order to be able to justify release of a medication to that person. Now a physician is, allowed to prescribe buprenorphine off-label in various forms, 
uh, uh, potentially for a patient with pain. Um, there are some people anecdotally who benefit from that. The term that I would normally use to refer to people who are in that gray zone where, I mean, I don't think it's all your patients. It sounds like you have some people who are functioning just fine and they just got discharged by their physician. But in the gray zone, volatile, dependent, dependence can be benign, but it can be not such a good thing, is complex persistent dependence. Um, that's a term I've taken from Jane Valentine, and I wouldn't apply the word uh, opioid use disorder or addiction, but I would tell the patient, look, you're in this gray zone. Um, but because of the structures we have, people are getting labeled in ways that will affect them for the rest of their lives. Um, and that seems to me also like uh, collateral damage. Not to say that the buprenorphine might not be a good thing. There are patients where that turns out to be fine and a good thing. Uh, I want to say one thing. There probably is somebody here who thought, he is outrageous. What he said is wrong. He's not getting it. He loves opioids. He thinks that everybody should be on high doses. Feel free to write me or tweet me or tell me I'm full of it. it, it it's okay to be in vigorous dialogue, and I'm, I'm welcome, I welcome that. Thank you.